Good morning, everyone. This is Erin Massey, the Chief Development Officer for the TGEN Foundation. Um, we are host, hosting um, this presentation today um, because of our, our life circumstances um, with COVID-19. Um, it has deeply affected each one of us, our families, our loved ones, our businesses. I get the pleasure of introducing Dr. Trent. He is our founder, our president, and research director. He leads the institute and the teams here and is going to talk a little bit about TGen, um, what the team, our genomic first responders, are doing in the COVID-19 space, and, um, and give you some additional um, overview of, of TGen and the work. So with that, I will turn it over. Okay, and can I just confirm that you can hear me and you can hear me reasonably well? Uh, I, I guess I'm asking Aaron for you to, to answer. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Okay, thank you very much. So really delighted to have everyone uh, join. I uh, wish again we had the opportunity to do this in person. Some of you may have been a part of the briefings that we've done in the past. This is uh, hopefully going to be a bit updated, but we also realize that many of the individuals are hearing this for the first time. So we hope that you'll just uh, bear with us as we go through and try to bring really a, a something in place that would be helpful for everyone involved. Uh, Dr. Ingenthaler, who I'll introduce in just a moment, will join me. Uh, and he is the expert on really pandemics, not just this particular coronavirus, but from uh, really decades of experience with CDC as the Arizona State Epidemiologist and as the co-leader of the division of TGen in microbiome and pathogen genetics for the past uh, about 14 years alongside Dr. Paul Keim, uh, our NAU colleague and and friends, uh, but again, David's really group, and I'll talk about that, has, has been the really major driver for everything we'll talk about today. So the next slide, and we'll see how the, I, what we want to really frame out for you today is that TGen's response, now the SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19, that's the name of the disease, so we'll, Occasionally revert to just talking about the virus. We'll, uh, you know, we'll also talk, of course, about the disease. But TGen is involved, and particularly alongside our City of Hope colleagues as well, that we work with on several fronts, particularly on the treatment side of the equation. But we're involved in testing, we're involved in tracking, and we're involved in treatment. And we'll be speaking about all three. I'll lead off with testing and then turn it over to Dr. Ingenthaler. So let me just remind those on the phone because there's so much dialogue on testing. You do want to ask the question, are we, are we going to test for the virus? Or for example, do we test for the antibodies to the virus, meaning you know your body's production of those uh, antibodies that might, right, right, might recognize the virus and hopefully neutralize it? Or do you test for both? And, and when do you do that? I'll address that uh, very briefly. And then are, are all of the tests the, the same? And, and I'll discuss some recent controversy just in case anyone has seen it. And then again, in the chat box at the end, we're happy to answer any questions going forward. So the next slide is really just meant to show the remarkable progress that David and his team made. He came to me on the 23rd of January and said you know, that he wanted to jump forward and go ahead and design an assay where TGen could be among the first that would be able to help respond to this. And in less than five weeks from the design to the Federal Drug Administration, the FDA providing TGen uh, among the first in, in Arizona to receive the, what's called the emergency use authorization and then we also had to stand up through the Center for Medicaid Services, a clinical laboratory dedicated to this. Both of those occurred in less than five weeks when we began uh, testing actually on around the ninth uh, for, for samples 
uh, for the uh, COVID, for the virus itself. So this is the standing up of the test for the virus. Uh, the next slide, if you could hit that, and hopefully it's going to move, and the computer isn't, uh, is just to remind you that we we're leveraging the work that came out of the fact that Dr. Engenthaler, as the former state epidemiologist, had to be prepared just like the governor is today to, to put together an incident command structure uh, that would detail all of the elements that go into try this, this type of effort from coordination on the medical side to coordination of all the partnerships, all the groups that we work with, and you'll hear about a series of those how we respond logistically and uh, from the planning standpoint going forward, et cetera. And, and again, we're fortunate that uh, David, for example, many of you will, that since a lot of this uh, call will be Arizona focused, you'll remember after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks uh, on the Senate office buildings, as well as of course the 9-11 uh, attacks excel, uh, itself, uh, that actually Dr. Engenthaler was the head of the bio threat uh, coordinating unit and was at the second game of the World Series that uh, in Arizona against the Yankees, if you remember uh, back that far as the incident command director for any bio threat uh, component there. So so I, I say this just to say, you know, that we're, we're very fortunate that we've had this long history and that we have the competence that we do to have undertaken uh, some of the efforts that we have. So the next slide is you can go to the FDA's website and the frequently asked questions. It says what laboratories are offering testing under the policy out outlined by section 4A, et cetera, et cetera. So if you click on that as shown on the next slide, then you'll see a long list of groups and this puts us uh, among, uh, you know, a large number uh, didn't used to be uh, nearly as large, but from Stanford, as you'll see, to the University of Washington. And again, it was the TGen North Clinical Laboratory that has set up and has this authorization and approval. So the next slide is uh, this would never have happened without the support of a number of the philanthropic efforts that helped us move this forward, which included the Garcia family with a significant gift, uh, Blue Cross, the Narba Institute, the Flynn Foundation, the Piper Institute, and of course the ongoing support of both TGen and, and City of Hope. But uh, this was critical and it's also been critical as we move towards the next round of testing with antibody testing as we'll talk about in a moment. So next slide. So this is the, the the journey if you have the disease. This is the COVID-19 journey. And it also should say to you, okay, if I'm on that journey, where am I on that journey? What test do I need? And, and when do I need it? So let's start up on the upper left-hand corner, the gray individual who's not been exposed to the virus the way that thankfully, hopefully most of those on the phone have not. And you'll see that once you're infected with the virus and the virus begins to grow, there's a period of time, you know, perhaps somewhere between seven to 14 days where you may be asymptomatic. You don't have any of the fever, you don't have the coughing, you don't have the loss of smell, you don't have any of the aspects that are associated with the symptomatology. But by your already, but unfortunately that's when you have the most likelihood of spreading to other individuals. Um, now, again, after about 14 days, you begin to develop antibodies. Now, I've put protective antibodies. We actually don't know it's exactly that, and that may come up again in the conversation with uh, David in a moment. But for those first few weeks, it's really critical to know who has the virus because those are the most active spreaders of the virus. Uh, so the genetic test for the virus, that's where you test literally the virus. Is it there? Is it not there? Is the critical test at the start. You'll see it down in the bottom that, you know, for those individuals and many of them 
are close to asymptomatic or they just thought they had, you know, uh, allergies that, uh, unfortunately, there's those individuals that, of course, go through hospitalization and, and all the other aspects. So you can just see again that antibody testing helps us determine who has a response to the virus, who's seen it. The virus frequently goes away. We call it clearing the virus. Um, and, and so the, that's where these tests come out, uh, and we can go over those as well. On the bottom, again, for those unexposed individuals that are going to receive a vaccination a year from now when it's readily available, um, that goal is to develop protective antibodies the way any vaccine would. So a lot of background around that. Only one more small slide on this to help you understand uh, some of the differences in this testing is that even within the... Now, we're going to stick for just a moment on the type of testing for the virus. And there are two types. You know, one on the left-hand side is sort of a cartoon. Well, it's not a cartoon. It's a nice picture of a Ferrari. It's the what's called the in vitro diagnostics part. It, it's, those are usually tests that are run that are very fast, like the Abbott test that the president has shown off and that they've provided to most states. Uh, and it has, as shown in the picture underneath it, that's another company called Diasorin's test, but it's the same aspect. That looked a bit like a Keurig uh, for anybody that has one of those at home, and they have kits that go into them, so cups that go into them with the testing. So again, these, quote, in vitro diagnostics are point-of-care devices. They're rapid, between five minutes and maybe an hour or so, but they're really restricted. Uh, you know, the AVID does a single test at a time, one at a time, goes through it, then you can put in one more, and then you can put in one more. And so you can see that even in our best case scenario, uh, you, you have to have the instrument, you have to have those cups uh, that would go into it if this thing was sort of like a Keurig, if you're using that to, to think about it. And it really doesn't scale to a large number. Now, there are laboratory developed tests like the one that we have approval at, at TGen. Uh, that's the tractor trailer of this kind of testing. If you need 5,000 tests, uh, you, you want to work in a laboratory developed testing environment because it's not slave to how many of those instruments do I have, how many cups do I am I provided. It's, it's really a workflow process against the number of individuals. And uh, again, this is where TGen sits at about uh, by the end of this week with that goal of about 600 tests a day, about 3,000 a week, and, and scaling from there. Now, I'll, I'll say in the middle, I've put it, uh, the statement, it says concern of false negatives, and that's because NPR and CNN and a number of others have raised the issue is that while these ultra-rapid tests like the Ferrari test, uh, the Abbott test is the specific example, are very, very fast. The question is, uh, is there, are they as accurate? And false negatives means we, we really don't want to call somebody negative if they have the virus, right? We don't want to put them back on the front line. We don't want to, we want to separate individuals. And so false negatives are really important. And uh, a study by uh, the Cleveland Clinic just being released now suggested that the the, uh, these, uh, particularly the Abbott one, for example, had a 15% false negative rate. The laboratory developed test by CDC, similar to ours, is close to zero for false negatives. So, you know, I think it, the reality is this will end up somewhere, somewhere uh, more, more closely to a, a smaller false negative, meaning the first studies that come out always have to be concern, confirmed and validated. But this is uh, this is important for us to think about, and um, again gives you a little sense of what we're doing. So the last slide that I have before I turn it over to Dave is just to say again, this gives you a sense of tracking. Yes, we are working on our antibody test, the standing that up. I think David will mention that. But tracking becomes now the next major part. Now I'll turn it back over to Dave. So Dave. Great, thanks Jeff. Uh, and, and thank you, Aaron. And uh, really uh, thrilled to be talking with the council today and, and others who have joined this uh, presentation. Uh, 
from either here in, in Arizona or from afar. Uh, this is obviously something that's affecting all of us. And, and my goal as the kind of the public health component to this overall response is to really make sure that not only are we developing good tests, but we are using those tests to not just inform uh, physicians on how to handle patients, but on inform public health officials and policymakers about what's actually happening with the, the disease, how the virus is moving around. And so that really is the, the tracking side of things. And, and if you guys bear with me, I am a, I'm an epidemiologist uh, and, and do wanna talk a little bit about the, the disease and give a, a quick update. I know you, everybody follows this pretty closely, but I'll, I'll give it from my perspective a little bit. Uh, this is the, the map of where all the cases have been in, in the U.S. We know the U.S. has by far the most number of cases in the world, and by far the most number of cases in the U.S. Is, has been up in the, the New York, New Jersey area, uh, up in the, the Northeast. This has been uh, the biggest problem. Uh, but the, the virus does continue to evolve, and, and, or at least the epidemiology continues to evolve and move uh, in other parts of the country. And if we look at this map, this is actually looking at um, where the, the virus is most active now based off of counties uh, and based off of rates uh, of the disease. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But we can see there's this shift uh, both from the west coast uh, towards the east and from the east coast towards the west. And, and now it's the Midwest that's really starting to get pounded uh, those other hot spots that we had earlier are, are, are less so, uh, as I mentioned, the Northeast and, and down in uh, Florida, Louisiana, those were the hardest hit for a while, uh, but it really has now moved uh, more towards the Midwest. And then in Arizona, we have uh, some issues of our own, but also probably some bright spots. We look at the total number of cases uh, in the U.S. Uh, and that epi curve, people keep talking about flattening the curve. Have we reached the peak or having a plateau? I think the answer is both. We've, we looks like we've really reached that that peak, which is becoming a plateau that'll probably carry out for uh, at least another couple of weeks as it starts to to drop down slowly, uh, and then hopefully more precipitously. And and one of the reasons why I think potentially precipitously is is a possibility is the fact that this is a respiratory virus uh, and. And there's no reason to think it won't act like a lot of other respiratory viruses. Uh, we can, um, if we look at this particular graph, and sorry for the messiness here, but this is looking at what we call influenza-like illness. And that means fever with a sore throat or with a cough, uh, very similar to what we would think of coronavirus-like disease. And this is looking at the past many years. And the red line here with the triangles represents the, the current year. And we're looking at weeks into the into the current year. So this is, we're about week 17 now uh, in, in 2020, and we're starting to drop off of influenza-like illness. Like every other year, this drops off about this time and really goes into almost quiescence. It's still a, a low level background of respiratory illness throughout the summer, but it does, does significantly drop off. That's why we think coronavirus is going to drop off, not just because it's already been through a first wave, uh, but because the summer hits, it really does slow down the progression of disease. So that, that's something we're watching closely, and, and hopefully this is what uh, will happen with coronavirus, at least for the summer period. In Arizona, uh, this is from the Department of Health Services, uh, their, their uh, dashboard system. We're at about 5,800 cases. The vast majority of those, of those, no doubt, are in the population centers, Phoenix and Tucson, Maricopa and Pima counties. Uh, and then we do see cases in every other county. Uh, that's not, doesn't really tell us where our problematic areas are. If we look at our rates, our rates um, show us, this is the number of cases per 100,000 that much of the state is similar to much of the West, which is about 30 to 50 cases per 100,000. Uh, however, in our Northern counties, especially Coconino, uh, which is our largest county, Navajo County and Apache County, we're seeing astronomical rates. And this is, this is where Flagstaff is, this is where I'm at, uh, is in Coconino County. But pretty much the, the vast majority of this problem has been unfortunately our Navajo Nation um, neighbors. And they're seeing the worst of it. Their rates are actually in some parts well over 500 per 100,000, uh, which makes it just about the worst place in the country for rates. And, 
and a place where we're spending a lot of time on. Also in Navajo County is the White Mountain Apache tribe, and they're just starting to get pummeled now in, in this past week, and they're seeing really high rates uh, also. And this tells us a little bit about the epidemiology of this disease and what we need to be continuing to be concerned about, which is not just where the most people live, uh, but where the, the highest risk situations are. And that could be, uh, and often is rural counties, uh, un unfortunately, uh, tribal communities, those which have um, less access to high quality um, care. Uh, they're, they're great hospitals, certainly on, on uh, the Navajo Nation, but they can only handle so many people. They have only so many ICU beds, and they've all had to been flown out to um, neighboring areas like Flagstaff, Phoenix, Albuquerque, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, this is an ongoing problem, and we hope that the summer, uh, the, the warmer months, I should say, is going to help slow this down. But it's also an area where we're uh, getting more and more focused and, and trying to put as many resources as possible. Uh, and I'll talk about some of our other at-risk populations in the state. Uh, here's our curve for Arizona, our up to date. Uh, we're, we're seeing a plateau, but it's got a little bit of a jagged edge to it. That's going to go up and down because we're going to have hot spots pop up, uh, which will drive the numbers up and down uh, on a, almost a daily basis. And then our, our fatality rates, this is the number of cases that we have, so it's not a rate, but the number of cases and the new deaths happening every day. Uh, we've certainly had, had a couple of really bad days here, several this past week. Uh, I think there'll be a couple more of those as some of these outbreaks really start to hit their peak, uh, especially again with, with some of our tribal communities. But one of the other areas of high risk that we're, we're spending a lot of time on and, and everybody in the public health world is, is the long-term care facilities. And I just use this as an example, the Washington case, where you did have an index patient on February 28th, uh, which then uh, rapidly grew to a massive outbreak in this one facility, 167 residents and staff infected. Uh, the staff fared well, 50 staff, zero, zero fatalities. But it was the, the, the residents that lived there, 38% fatality rate uh, occurred in the residents, which is astronomical. Over a third of the, the people living there uh, and, and it's because they have higher conditions. They're you know, elderly with multiple chronic conditions. And these are the people that we know who are gonna die if they get infected or have the highest chance. And that's no matter what, as we move forward, we have to think about that. This particular facility infected eight other facilities specifically, partially because transfer of patients and partially because transfer of staff working at multiple sites. And these staff not being sick, being asymptomatic or having mild symptoms, unknowingly carrying the virus from uh, nursing home to nursing home. And now over 30 nursing homes have been infected in King County. We're seeing that in Arizona. Uh, we're seeing it throughout the, the country. In fact, uh, New York Times has done a good job of tracking this uh, and identifying outbreaks across the country uh, associated with nursing homes uh, and, and rehab facilities. But also maybe one of the undermentioned areas is the correctional uh, system, jails and, and prisons. Uh, have also been seeing very large outbreaks. So here in Arizona, we've definitely um, uh, been interacting with our, um, our sheriff's departments, the correctional facilities, nursing homes, public health, and, and tribes to really make sure that no matter what, as we start to turn the lights back on and, and the people start to go back to work and the society gets moving again, that these are the areas that we're gonna spend all of our time uh, focusing on and protecting. Uh, and, and one other area to mention is the, we did talk a little bit about asymptomatic cases, it's the healthcare workers, the first responders that we know um, have been getting exposed and can carry around the virus without showing any symptoms. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we're doing screening for those. And this has had a massive problem in Italy. Uh, we actually see it here in Arizona too with, with healthcare workers becoming in, infected and exposed. So that leads to uh, our tracking and screening, that we're, we're tackling that from a number of areas. Jeff talked about our, our testing. Uh, we did do early level community screening. So some of the first testing in Arizona, we were looking at those that were flu negative, but had respiratory symptoms, those influenza-like illnesses. And we found, so for instance, the, the first uh, case of that occurring in, in Southern Arizona, that quickly switched over to doing diagnostic testing of all suspect patients. But now we're screening uh, healthcare workers and other special populations, homeless, incarcerated, uh, as well as uh, nursing homes and, and skilled nursing facilities. 
Uh, and we did help stand up the first community drive-through testing clinic in Arizona, uh, here in, in Northern Arizona, working with Blue Cross and Blue Shield and, and Northern Arizona Healthcare and the local health departments. Uh, that is now being used for healthcare worker screening. A couple times a week, it's being devoted to healthcare workers uh, being able to go through, get tested, and we're, we're doing the, the testing for that. And then the other part of the tracking is the uh, part that tgen has been working on for years, which is genomic tracking. And we've really uh, helped develop this as an important tool for public health. We're, we're sequencing all the positive samples in Arizona, working with the state health department and with the other a large commercial testing labs to make sure that they all get the virus gets sequenced out of those. And then we build this big viral family tree. Uh, and this is this looks kind of messy. This is looking at thousands of sequences from across the world that are all being shared. And we're doing the same thing in Arizona. We're we're sequencing, uploading into these databases, and then we can look more specifically at what's happening in Arizona to help our our healthcare workers understand and, and hopefully track down cases. For instance, this is highlighting uh, an, an initial set of Arizona strains within that family tree, kind of that ancestry.com look. We can track it uh, as the strains move, uh, where they come from uh, and coming into Arizona and how they're moving in Arizona. Uh, here's one specific example. I'll zoom in on a branch on this tree and I just want to point out, uh, there, there's uh, these are color coded by country and, and the red here is the US. Uh, these are Arizona cases here and there is no linkage with any other Arizona cases or with any U.S. cases. In fact, it's on the same branch as multiple Australian genomes uh, in a larger group of Australian and New Zealand genomes. And then there's a couple of U.S. cases that have popped out there as well. So this really helps then the epidemiologists focus on, do, is there a surrounding outbreak with this case uh, that needs to be stopped? Or can they just track it back to where the original infection occurred? So in some cases we see large outbreaks, in some cases we see these one-offs that are associated with a very specific travel or visitor from a, a certain part of the, the country. So now we're moving into this phase where the case numbers are manageable and we can actually do this almost in real time. Anytime we get a positive sample, we just roll that over into our uh, tracking, our, our genomic tracking, and try to get this information back to public health and they can respond and do that contact tracing uh, with much more information, with real actionable intelligence on really how to, how to trace it back uh, versus um, just really having good guesstimates based off of who was contacted by who. Now we can see proof positive where strains are coming from. So that's, that's some of the exciting things that, that TGen is moving into. Uh, Jeff talked about our serology testing. We are actually doing our initial tests of that this week and hoping in the next couple of weeks that's going to be something that we're using to, to help screen both for uh, workplace uh, screening and, and all those other populations that we're talking about, but even to support uh, the general public needing to know who was exposed and who wasn't. Uh, as we learn whether or not that gives you protective immunity, we don't know that yet, uh, but at least we're going to continue to add layers of, of information uh, on the, the tracking of this virus as this outbreak progresses. And with that, I think Jeff, I think the next uh, spot to turn it to, uh, oh, sorry, I just want, that was just uh, circling of where those Arizona cases were. And there we go, onto the a treatment slide, if you want to take it from here, Jeff. Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure that everybody did know that, you know, in addition to the incredible staff that is working with uh, David, and I wish we had put a picture in one of these times, David, you need to get a group shot I say that in part because you'd be surprised at the, you know, without exaggeration, I'm clearly the only dinosaur you would see on that. Uh, David is uh, sort of in the middle and it looks like a bunch of teenagers working uh, at the bench, you know, the, the you know, really the youth, uh, youthfulness of a lot of the people working on, on this uh, is, is just fantastic and the commitment that they have because this group is without a question, uh, you know, doing the 18 hour a day uh, efforts that it requires for this type of a, uh, of a situation. But going beyond, and I'm also grateful for some people, an example, you know, we've, we've detailed a handful of people, Tim McDaniel is an example of, uh, you know, a critical person here in Phoenix that plays a role there and vice versa, the group down here trying to support uh, 
everything from ordering to bringing in the the materials to some of the analysis is is really critical. Okay, so with that as a further background, I, I do want you to know that we are involved in the treatment side of this, and I'm just going to highlight one of those. I, I will tell you again with our City of Hope partners, uh, there are almost 20 different studies that collectively between our group uh, and theirs that are moving forward, the majority of those towards the development of either uh, a vaccine or a treatment. But I was, I'm excited to talk to you about the effort that is going on in Arizona today, and that's shown on the next slide. And, you know, for those on the phone or on the video, uh, this will come out of the press release uh, in the next uh, either few hours or certainly by tomorrow. And all of us are aware of the controversy associated with the hydroxychloroquine Zithromycin as a Z pack that, you know, was it uh, over hyped by uh, the administration? Is it beneficial? Is it is it not? What's the? And remember, that's an anti malarial drug, uh, you know, Z pack, just the antibiotic that is used in combination with that drug that people were hopeful would be useful. The issue has been not that there aren't some responses, but the uh, it, it's very difficult on both heart, uh, you know, definite cardiotoxicity, uh, but also some other aspects that make it more, more difficult to use that. So there is another anti-malarial drug. It's used also for what are called trypanosomes. And, uh, and so this is an example in which Dr. Sneel Sharma, who is uh, office two doors down is uh, one of the physicians alongside Dr. Von Hoff on the on the cancer side that practices at Honor Health at the Virginia Piper Cancer Center came up with the idea of looking at a different anti-malarial called uh, atrovaquone and along with a Z-pack or azithromycin as a combination. And why would he do that? Well, it's it, it appears in the testing that we can do before putting it into a patient, but it's incredibly more uh, potent than the hydroxychloroquine. It depletes the fuel, what are called the nucleotides. This is an RNA virus. Uh, and if they don't get the RNA molecules, the nucleotides, then that can kill the virus directly. Again, there is no heart risk with this particular combination, very much in contrast to the hydroxychloroquine. Um, and again, it's already been approved for a different reason, so a physician can order it. And in this case, we have approval, including IRB approval, uh, for the combination of these two in patients. So it's again, it's approved for parasitic diseases. It has a high safety profile, and we're really fortunate that Western IRB is the IRB that we've used that's approved this. Honor Health has approved it through their IRB for an initial 30 patients here in Arizona. The first three patients uh, were actually um, consented for this uh, uh, this morning, and we'll begin to analyze the response by uh, the group, again, at TGen North, looking to see whether or not we can plot the disappearance of the virus with this. And of course, our hope is that the patients respond. Uh, so these are either, uh, moderate to severely affected individuals. Many of them would be intubated, just like you've seen on television. They consent to this. Uh, of course, it's a clinical trial, uh, and this is just one of many in the country. We understand that, but this is one that we're rolling out as a first in uh, patient, first in human clinical trial, uh, and a great example, we believe that you know local research does benefit local patients first. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll see where where this where this goes. So the last slide is really just again to say thank you for all of you. Uh, my understanding, as you've heard from Aaron Massey, is that people are muted. There is a button down at the bottom that uh, uh, that allows you to put some questions out there by chat. Uh, you, you know, the using the chat box that's there. Um, and uh, so anyone that wants to throw a question either at Dr. Ingenthaler or myself, feel free to. Dr. Tyler, I'm going to 
That's a great, great question, Aaron. As you as you know, uh, we've been in, in, as it's been called, the genomic first responders uh, for for a long period of time, and and have worked on outbreaks and pandemics on the past in the past, uh, developing our tools and and capabilities over the past decade to do this. Uh, for instance, in a little over a decade ago, the pandemic uh, swine flu outbreak. We were able to kick in gear really fast and, and work with the state of Arizona to find the first cases uh, in Arizona because the CDC was already backlogged with test requests, uh, which is still happening obviously today. Uh, and, and we've been building up since then, and we've been uh, helping to develop genomic surveillance for the state of Arizona to help identify the first earliest onset of outbreaks. Uh, and uh, now with this particular situation, we've stood up a a infectious disease CLIA diagnostic lab uh, for the first time to be able to use these next generation tools uh, to help treat patients directly. In the past, our, our focus has been more in support of only public health. Now we can do both in support of public health and, and with physicians and their patients directly. So I think that that is something we'll be able to use uh, moving forward beyond COVID-19. We'll get there uh, for sure. And there's lots of other needs uh, for for all these uh, capabilities that we've been able to stand up over the past couple months. Great. This is Jeff, I guess I would say just to echo that the other area that again now that we have this Kaleo lab established, and I would argue, it, you know, again, not only is it approved by CMS, we've also had to go through secondary approvals like California, uh, which has its own second round of that. I, I would say what was really helpful for that is we were with California when for our cancer testing and just to remind people cancer is not waiting for the flattening of the curve the testing and the research we do in the in a variety of these diseases and disorders including cancer continues to go on but when our when our clinical lab for cancer testing submitted to California it took us 8 months to get approval the virology testing for the clinical lab that Dr. Ingenthaler leads uh, took us three and a half days from the submission of the information to get approval. And they granted us uh, basically uh, full approval and not, not any conditional approval for virology. What that, what that means is it just allows us across the states of the union to be able to uh, be prepared for uh, anything. We won't have to go through that uh, process again. Okay, so any other questions either from? Uh, yeah, we have a couple of more. So um, one question we received was, can we, Dr. Trent, you touched on this, but when will the antibody test be available? Well, uh, yeah, so our antibody test will be available out of the clinical laboratory, uh, I would say probably in the next maybe three weeks or less. The question is, which antibodies do we want to use? I and and we're validating those that we think are going to be the most useful. So there's, there are going to be, unfortunately, there's, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, there are going to be multiple options, and these antibodies tests look at different types of antibodies that you generate. So I'm, I'm not trying to be complex. I'm just trying to say we're doing a thoughtful process of reviewing as best we can information. Uh, Dr. Engenthaler, Dr. McDaniel, myself, were on the individual, uh, the on the phone with individuals from Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, they have 100,000 uh, positive patients in that system that cuts across two or three states. As we work collectively together with, uh, with them to identify the, the test that, we're, and we're gonna cross share information on how good everybody's test is. Um, in part, you know, they have so many more cases, but then as you heard from David, we have, in, incredible ability 
to go much deeper into East Case because I mean they can barely he keep their head above water. Uh, so this is uh, you know I think in the next few weeks we'll have the first version version one of our antibody test up, and uh, well, you know that that's probably the best answer that I could give you. Let me let me add something another layer onto that, Aaron, and and uh, that's really the the point of why we do and want to do antibody testing. Uh, there is a general assumption that uh, we'll just be able to start testing everybody and know who's immune and who can go back to work and and the like. And and so one we already talked about. We don't really know uh, about protective immunity at this point. And just having antibodies may or may not mean that you're protected. It likely means you were exposed and maybe had the disease. Uh, we're hoping that it acts uh, very similar to other similar viruses and that there will be a certain amount of protective immunity that'll last in, in the, the vaccine that'll come out, you know, six to 12 to 18 months from now will uh, really help boost that. But I think as we start testing and, and as has been seen in multiple places around the country, people are going to be really surprised about how low uh, the level of community immunity is. That meaning the percentage of people who actually were exposed overall. In some places, there's going to be fairly high rates, such as in New York, uh, just because there was so much virus transmission when you had millions of people living on top of millions of people. That's not the case out West. Uh, and my guess is we're going to see somewhere in the, the uh, certainly less than 10% of the overall population uh, being exposed after we get through the, the first, at least the first wave of this. Uh, and so we can't just make decisions based off of that. We can't just say, well, we can all go back to work once we have 50% immunity or some level of herd immunity. That's not going to happen for a while. Uh, but the, the antibody testing is certainly going to help us understand the, the natural history of this virus as it's moved through our community. And it's going to help us track uh, and hopefully identify those people that maybe can be put in high risk situations that can be uh, cohorted and working with directly with COVID patients moving forward or working with high risk patients such as in nursing homes. So we're, we're it's not a, gonna be a, a, a cure all all by itself. Uh, it's just gonna add some, uh, again, tracking information for, for policy decision making. Thank you, Dave. Um, a follow up question to that was, um, when will the test be available to the public? If it's available in three to four weeks, um, the follow-up was, when will that be available to the public? And one other question um, that I'll give you, I'll, I'll, lead, I'll add is, um, are we going to be seeing reinfection in patients in Arizona? Yeah, so the, let's go with that second question first. The, we don't uh, truly understand uh, who's going to be at risk for reinfection. Uh, I think partly uh, what's been uh, identified already and discussed in the media, this thought that some people who were sick got better and then got reinfected uh, is likely in large part people who still had virus lingering around and then for some reason uh, it, it built back up enough to, to cause more serious disease and it looks like maybe they had two bouts of infection. Uh, we know we're, I'm, I'm, essentially making some educated guesses on this because we've been tracking some individuals serially and after they get through their main course of illness, they'll still have virus lingering around at very low levels, but levels we can detect with our molecular assays for multiple weeks, maybe beyond two weeks after their, even their initial symptoms showed up, uh, as well as people who are asymptomatic and carrying that virus around. There may be a reason what that may cause a, a secondary uh, episode while they're still carrying that virus. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't really know if reinfection is actually occurring, occurring after people have really gotten better and completely have eliminated virus and then they get reinfected. Uh, we do uh, a little bit about uh, immunity. There were some studies with macaques. Macaques are not man, but at least we get some information there. Uh, it's a similar system where they were uh, infected, uh, recovered, and then uh, for 30 days uh, post recovery, they were unable to be reinfected again. And that's just the length of the study. So it could be much, much longer than that. But we do think that there is some level of protective immunity that does occur that will prevent automatic reinfection, or at least during this, uh, this initial uh, wave of cases. 
uh, as being available to the public. Uh, there, there's a number of commercial tests out there available now. There are going to be some at-home testing. Uh, we uh, at TGen, through the leadership of Dr. John Alton, uh, are going to be uh, announcing a uh, a program to for people to sign up if they've been exposed, or excuse me, if they had been previously diagnosed, uh, to be able to um, actually follow and monitor their level of antibody uh, for some period of time. And that's going to be a citizen science type approach. Uh, and I think there's going to be a lot more of those. The, the test itself uh, from our CLIA lab will be available through the healthcare and public health system uh, to screen those uh, in, in most need. And in some cases, that's going to be with large uh, employers as well. And we will work with their health staff, their employee health staff, to help set up such screening programs too. Thanks, Dave. Um, we, we've received the, this next question a few times um, and asked a couple of different ways. Can we expect a second wave of cases in the country? And if so, when should we expect that second wave? Well, we, we don't know for sure. Uh, we, we, from you know, an epidemiological standpoint, it makes sense that we will. Uh, I, I'm fearing that we absolutely will, and it'll be much worse than the first wave. And, and my reason for thinking that is uh, we, we've, had it, we've had this, it's still ongoing, but we do think it's gonna essentially crest and, and start to drop off uh, and, and maybe go into low-lying levels during the, the summer. But the, the problem is, is it won't go away. It'll still be here. And once the cooler months come that help really um, uh, propel more uh, transmission and more cases, uh, the virus will have already been seeded around the state and around the country and, and unfortunately around the world. Uh, and, and therefore, um, the, it'll likely be able to hit a lot faster, a lot sooner. The good news is, is we know exactly who we have to protect and we need to keep protecting them all the way through this. So our goal is to really limit the amount of deaths, even if the second wave is much harsher than the first wave. Uh, we, I think we can do a good job of limiting the overall amount of deaths uh, by following a lot of the recommendations and protecting those most at risk. While the rest of us are getting back to work uh, and have been um, out there probably sharing the virus a little bit and developing more herd immunity, uh, but again, most important to protect those at most risk. Great. We have a couple of more minutes, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna, we're getting lots of questions here, so I'm just gonna keep giving them to you. Um, the, one of the recent questions we got is, does a future vaccine have to be a viral strain specific? So I'll, and, and Jeff, please jump in at any time, um, but the, <clears throat> We, there's a large number of vaccines being developed right now in, in a couple of clinical trials. Uh, these will likely be strain specific for this SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, even though we're seeing lots of different strain types around the world, the vaccine should still be pretty specific to all of, all of those strains and, and maybe for a larger number of coronaviruses. And, and I know that some are even looking more for universal vaccines. Uh, but likely what we'll see is the first effective ones that are safe and effective and can be used will be very specific to this virus. Uh, and um, given the amount of mutations that we've been seeing, uh, we don't anticipate that it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, change that much, that, that a developed vaccine won't work well uh, in the, you know, for the foreseeable future. But there could be enough changes essentially pile up in, in the genome of this virus over time that the vaccine needs to be updated, not too dissimilar from the influenza vaccine. I guess I would just also add that this could have a, there's, there's no question that for some of the initial antibody testing that is very specific if the virus begins to mutate, which it does as it goes through individuals, that some of those tests may end up not being particularly useful. The, just as Dr. Angenthaler mentioned, uh, for vaccines, usually you're trying to spread a broader net so that a single genetic change doesn't, doesn't sort of knock out the potential effectiveness. But, um, but that, that's a, it's, again, I think based on the, I don't know what today's count was, maybe the 5,000 or 6,000 
genomes that we have to work with would lead us to think that a vaccine would be pretty effective for uh, that the rate of change of mutation is uh, likely going to mean those will still be effective for a good period of time. Thanks. So before we wrap up, um, I just we talked about testing, tracking, and treatment today, and the importance of all of those. Um, uh, Dave, is there anything that you want to talk about with regards to our pathogen genomics division as a whole, infectious disease or the microbiome? I mean, we focused most of the day today on COVID-19 because that's impacting all of our lives um, now, today. Um, but is there anything that you want the callers on the phone to be able to hear or to know? Um, I, I mean, we're talking about infectious disease more than ever. I'm seeing statistics that are saying by the year 2050, um, it will be the number one cause of death in the world, um, beating cancer and heart disease and others. Um, what, if you were giving, if you're going to leave these callers with a message, what should that be today? Both that question for both you and Jeff. Sure. Let me start. Maybe um, Dr. Trent could wrap that up. But from from my perspective, the two things. One is the problems that we had before COVID nineteen are still our problems and will be our problems moving into the future. One of the reasons for the concern about the increase in rate of infectious disease causing death is antibiotic resistance and our lack of available treatments for the things that we did have treatments for. Uh, and, and there's a lot of problems around that. Uh, we, we will continue to have these emerging uh, viruses uh, and, and maybe other emerging pathogens. This won't be the, this certainly wasn't the first, it won't be the last. Probably won't even be the last coronavirus. We've already seen a couple others come out of animals and, and cause serious disease. Uh, and so that reinforces our need to um, use whatever tools we have to uh, not just what we're doing now, which is the emergency responder, first responder uh, piece, but be doing constant and continual surveillance. Uh, so we better understand these organisms, uh, the, the diseases they're causing, uh, and, and at least my last piece, which is this COVID-19, we had been working on a number of things that I mentioned beforehand uh, to, in, to start doing genomic surveillance and, and do this type of uh, genomic epidemiology or kind of this ancestry.com look at these pathogens. This, the COVID-19 situation has really forced uh, the hand uh, of uh, policymakers and public health uh, to essentially say we have to bring 21st century science into this. And that's what we've been trying to do before this, but now it, it absolutely is. We are using 21st century next generation science on, on a day-to-day -to -day basis and, and to help treat patients, to help respond to outbreaks and, and hopefully lessen the overall uh, pandemic in the end. That's going uh, to be critical part of the infrastructure. We can't go back to 20th century public health, which is absolutely what was being used predominantly until this outbreak. Uh, we do have to say uh, we're in a new era now. We have to use these tools to, to get more actionable intelligence. And, and thankfully, TGen's been out there on the forefront. Uh, you know, Dr. Trent setting up TGen almost two decades ago uh, has led to us having this ability to provide a real profound impact today. Uh, and, and we got to continue to parlay all, all those successes. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Trent. Yeah, I just want to sort of change gears. And for all of those that have been willing to tune in, we realize how many sources of information you have. We're, we're just want to thank you for taking the time out to get a sense of what we're doing here. Local research does benefit local patients first. And we're grateful for Robin and Vicki and the Women's Philanthropy Council for uh, their willingness to bring this together. We'll, we'll sign off at this point.